Welcome back to the AEC Disruptors podcast, your platform to help push the AEC industry forward. I'm your host, Chris Riddell, and joining me today is my co-host, Jackson Sensat. What's going on, Jackson? Oh, nothing much, Christopher. Just more rain here in San Antonio. Um, you know, it's just going to be a daily occurrence from here on out. Consistent rain. You know, we actually have some rain here, and I tried to work outside twice today. Looked nice, walked outside both times, got rained on. So it was not a fun time. Um, so today we're actually talking, uh, it's a special episode. It's just the two of us. Uh, and it's really in the, uh, in light of the new news about Katera and what happened there, uh, we decided it would be interesting to come together and talk a little bit about, you know, what were their aspirations? What were they headed after? Um, what can we learn from this and use this experience to really help push the industry forward? So we hope you get to listen, enjoy, and check back for more. On today's episode, we are having a special episode. Jackson and I are getting together talking about uh, the most recent news with Katera. We felt like it was uh, interesting. It was interesting news. I mean, I think they're an interesting company, what they're trying to achieve. And there's a lot to kind of dig into and talk through, you know, Jackson, before we really dive into the topic, you know, who was Katera, you know, and from your perspective, um, you know, what were they trying to trying to achieve? Yeah, so it's it's kind of interesting that this happened, you know, a few weeks after we released our, uh, you know, Silicon Valley startup mindset episode. Oh, yeah. Think like a tech company. And now we're talking about a tech company that went out of business. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we'll get we'll get into like, you know, some of the reasons why this happened. Um, but Katera, you know, was founded in 2015 by a, uh, you know, group of real estate and electronics, um, pretty much big wigs. Uh, you know, it ended up being headed up by a guy named Michael Marks. Um, he was their original CEO. And he's somebody who is extremely well respected. Um, within the Silicon Valley community. Um, you know, he's led a number of startups to success. Um, but basically what Katera tried to do, um, and they were funded by SoftBank, which is out of Japan. Um, so, and SoftBank actually poured in more than a billion dollars into the company. But what Katera basically tried to do was actually truly be a turnkey construction company or actually, better yet, a turnkey building company. Um, From design and, all the way to installation mm, and turnover. Exactly. Because there's a lot of companies out there that claim to be turnkey um, when they're not actually turnkey. <laughs> but Katera actually tried to do that themselves. They were you know, the general contractor. They were the subcontractor. They managed their own labor. They procured their own materials. Um, they did all their own prefabrication, um, specifically. They designed their buildings. Designed their buildings, right? Exactly. Can't forget about the architects. Um, and, you know, they really invested heavily in heavy timber. Um, you know, I, I read that it was like a Flextronics for construction. Um, you know, they just basically built, controlled the whole building process. Um, so, you know, they started opening up these factories. Um, I believe the original one was in Phoenix, Arizona, um, with a heavy focus on the heavy timber side, but, um, you know, other aspects as well, um, when it comes to prefabrication. Um, yeah. So how, do you just want me to give the whole story from beginning to end or are we good I, on know, who I, they are now? I, have I, have I covered who they are? <laughs> I, I think so. I think that's a pretty good, uh, um, concept or description there. And, um, you know, it did seem like they were, they were an outside perspective trying to disrupt. And we've talked on this podcast before, you know, I, I feel pretty firmly that in the entity that's going to disrupt the industry is going to come from the outside. And, and that's certainly what they tried to do. And, and it seemed like they were really trying to vertically integrate by acquiring and um, building out every phase of the built environment. And so that they were the, you know, as you talked about everything from the design to the manufacturer to the, you know, they, they own the whole supply chain. 
um, which is a huge undertaking. And I think they were pretty successful for a period of time. And, and so now we, we sit here and we, we learn that, you know, they're going out of business and, you know, there are, I think there's going to be lessons learned from this. This will be probably one of many conversations that people have about uh, what they're trying to do. Cause I think what they're trying to do is, is noble and maybe needed uh, perhaps. So, you know, why do you think, well, one, you know, your background's in construction. Why do you think they took this on this idea of being this, you know, master turnkey company? I think they took it on because, you know, there are just, as we've discussed over and over again on this podcast at nauseum, and as we will continue to discuss, um, construction is just incredibly inefficient. And that goes, you know, from the field all the way to, you know, project management, having to deal with a bunch of different vendors, you know, different delivery companies, um, you know, third party inspectors. Um, there's just so many, there's such a big cast of characters that goes into building a construction project that, um, you know, and every construction project is, you know, its own unique thing um, that I think that they wanted to have a little bit more control in the entire process because, you know, in construction, you can really only control what's in-house and even then that's extremely difficult and you just kind of trust the uh, other players. Um, I can't tell you how many times the delivery truck told me they were going to, you know, be at the delivery lane at two o'clock and they show up two hours later and it's blocked and then they have to come back the next day and that's lost money right there, you know, and that's, you know, it's just a random delivery company. They don't play by our rules, you know? Um, so they wanted to control the whole thing. That way there was a little bit less, you know, margin for error or room for, um, you know, external forces to impact their projects. Um, I think that, you know, just because you have a lot of money and you throw a lot of money at the problem doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to solve it without proper management and proper planning. I think that's a good point. I do, you know, when you look, when I looked them up, cause I was doing some research for the episode and well, one they're they were described everywhere as like a construction technology company. Um, and so it, it is interesting when you reference our previous talks about that mindset and there was such a focus on, um, trying to, I mean, I, I think I read this too, bring the Silicon Valley approach to building. So, I mean, it really is like the poster child for our conversation, but their hope was they were going to be able to automate the building process and reduce the reliance on skilled labor. And I think in fact, that skilled labor issue still came to, came to be. And, you know, I was listening to um, a podcast yesterday about this and somebody said that it's important. And this is a lesson learned, maybe moving forward. It's important for firms that are going to try to do this to be able to manage the, the offsite construction. So, you know, they're real big and trying to do the manufacturing aspect, but also have the skill set required to be able to manage the, the, in the field. And because it still is going to be a component that there's in the field. And so it seemed like there was that, um, that aspect of, I don't know if it was lack of fully understanding the complexity of the industry. Um, you know, there are, everything is unique. There are all nuances. I mean, there is that day to day and, you know, I, I, it seems like if we're looking back when we come to, if somebody comes to disrupt this industry, they need to have a good sense of what it is to be say in the field versus, you know, in the, in the warehouse and everything in between. There's a reason why in management in GCs and subcontractors, um, there's a reason why, you know, you have both people who are college educated, who are trained in management in general business, but also people, you know, right alongside them who have experience in the day-to-day -day of the field and who realize that, you know, 
construction doesn't operate in this perfect vacuum. There's so many external forces down to the weather. I mean, there was a concrete guy who I loved, um, who used to say, you know what the only thing that's going to stop the rain is? The ground. Pouring concrete. <laughs> <laughs> um, point. Anyways, and I think that, you know, Katera, in theory, is probably the perfect company in the I like in terms of what we've been talking about on this podcast, you know, over the past few seasons. Um, it's just that the execution may have not been there. And I think part of it was, was maybe at the tip top, you know, there wasn't that much of an understanding of what went into the process from conceptual design all the way to operations. And there was this thinking that, and I know people in Silicon Valley VCs are guilty of this is, you know, if you throw enough money at a problem, like I said before, you know, you're going to be able to solve it. And, you know, when you're working against deadlines and construction projects and you've got hourly workers, um, you know, it just doesn't always work out perfectly. You know, even if you try to, you know, do a lot of prefabrication. I think it's that, but also maybe the tech just isn't there yet. You know, to I think have that's a company a good point. like this. I think it's a good point because um, I remember in in my past life and other times, I I did some research on this idea of being. You know, we have this idea of being a first mover. Um, they come into an industry, they do something, and you have those early adopters, and it kind of continues on all the way to what ultimately would be laggards and the first mover has inherent um, advantages because of the first one kind of to do something. But one of the huge disadvantages of being that first mover is the technology may not be there. Um, you know, the infrastructure may not be ready. Uh, everyone now gets to learn from what they did and there will be a Katera 2.0 and they'll probably just knock it right out of the park. But I mean, there, you know, not just in our industry, but other industries, I mean, there's tons of examples of these first movers who created, you know, even like things like the laptop and computers and everything. What we think today as like the, the supreme product creator is typically not even the case. You know, somebody hit the ground running, put it out there. People weren't ready for it. They, the laws didn't catch up. The insurance wasn't there, whatever it may be. And I think that was one of the main things perhaps that Katera ran into was this idea of they had a great idea. Um, you know, maybe they didn't execute it exactly the way they planned. I do think they grew too fast. Uh, you know, every time I turn around, they were acquiring a company. They were trying to do all aspects of the, you know, everything right away instead of maybe saying, let's start maybe just on the construction side and maybe get really good at, prefab and modular and then start to acquire downstream. Um, I think that probably, you know, companies need to be able to scale, but they got to be able to do it at a reasonable pace. So, I mean, I think both of those kind of contribute this idea of a first mover, all these advantages, but the disadvantage of not having what you may need and then just growing flat out too quickly. Yeah. 2015 was not that long ago and there's a lot of stuff on them. Like, <laughs> you know, they got this huge contract to, you know, build all these homes in Saudi Arabia and India. So they've got their, you know, foot in there as well, as well as the U.S. Um, you know, one of their, I mean, from all accounts that I've read, it looks like the first sign of them kind of being in some trouble was when they had to close down that Phoenix factory, you know? Yeah. And I mean, I think they ran into the same problems that everyone else did. I mean, I do think COVID was, they cited COVID was a problem and we have job sites that got shut down. And one thing that was interesting, and I saw it come up a few times on different websites and they contributed some of their issues to the, you know, soaring labor cost. And you, it's a, it's kind of ironic. I mean, their whole goal was to reduce reliance on skilled labor yet the issue they ran into was the cost of labor. Um, and so, you know, that kind of goes back to maybe all the pieces just weren't ready yet. 
yeah, all the pieces weren't just ready yet. And if your goal is to, you know, <laughs> automate the process and do all this prefabrication um, and not have high labor costs because you're managing the whole process, the tech needs to be there, you know, and you just can't, <laughs> you can't just, again, you can't just throw hundreds of millions of dollars at something without a clear vision, a clear plan, and the right people in place to execute. Pandemic they, uh, or not. Yeah, I mean, I think they've raised at over $2 billion um, throughout their life. And, and I, you know, I've worked with several people that work there, and they're all very sharp people. I mean, I, part of that uh, webinar I was listening to yesterday was about a lot of sort of business owners across the United States talking about how can they utilize all of this talent that's now coming into the workforce. I mean, there's a lot of people that are coming back into the workforce that have a lot of great ideas are very skilled, um, you know, high tech type people. So, I mean, they had a ton of people, I, you know, it's like they had all of the ingredients for the right thing. It just, it most likely will probably look back and realize the timing was just not there. And it was, you know, they had a ton of projects. I mean, I read that they acquired a construction firm and then took on all, you know, hundreds of projects that firm had. And it, it was consistent. They, they continued to take on more projects, more side business without really taking the time, at least from my perspective, to fully flesh out all of the aspects of their, you know, their, their workflow. And then as a result, we find ourselves now talking about things like the labor cost and, you know, all the stuff that impacted them. And I mean, no, I'm sure COVID, like if there's no COVID, we're probably not having this conversation and they've, they'll, they'll make it through a little bit longer. So that had a huge impact like everyone else, but it, it did seem like they maybe lost focus of what they were, what they were after. Yeah. I've heard it said that when it comes to the cutting edge, you don't necessarily want to be the one who is right on the cutting edge, but you just want to be, you want to be just behind it. Yeah. It's like, and the I bleeding think this edge. is, yes, I think that this is that situation. Yeah. I, um, you know, it was, I don't know if I necessarily agree with this statement, but I was doing some research and there's another company out there that, you know, maybe similar, maybe not be similar. And I think they were called like the change order group, but they had a little harsher words and they were, they were afraid that this would set the industry back. And I'd be curious to get your thoughts on that. Their perspective was the reason this would set the industry back is we're already kind. I mean, construction's already risky. There's a lot of risk in construction. Uh, this idea of a construction technology startup is not as prevalent we're, you know, we have to kind of get drug into adopting new technology. So do you now, here was a firm that was going to try to do what you and I probably said needed to happen. They had a ton of money involved and it didn't work. Do you think we're going to find ourselves, people are going to be more or less reluctant to give money towards a company like this in the near future? Or do you think people recognize there was a need and we just need to figure out how to facilitate that. You know, <laughs> it's hard to be set back whenever you're already back. <laughs> yeah. We're already behind. As an industry. More behind. We're already behind as an industry. And, you know, I really love the concept of this company. And I just think that it needs to start smaller and take a little bit more of baby steps to get there um, because what they tried to do is pretty revolutionary for the industry like like i said we've talked about <laughs> i i think we've you know both talked a lot on this podcast about the possibility of companies like this that are truly turnkey and do have a big focus on the automation side and prefabrication and, you know, kind of reducing waste in the construction industry, you know, 
Um, so we've talked about design I, build, you know, our episode with Anthony was design build is the way and maybe Fermi's get really good at that before they take on the, the supply chain aspect. Right. It was just too big, too fast, you know, coupled with the pandemic. Um, I think that in the future, there will be other companies that pop up like this because you can see what they did well, see what they didn't do well, and then try to, you know, build a profitable company from there. And I think there will be a need for companies like this in the future. I agree. They mean, they had a big push. Um, you know, one of the things I kept seeing was they had a big push towards mass timber. And uh, I didn't realize, but at least in North America, there's a movement towards that because it addresses sort of the embodied carbon issue better than like concrete or steel. And so, you know, I, I think they were on to the right, um, right path and focusing on innovations around mass timber. Now, we didn't necessarily see a lot of those come, come to fruition, but I think they were saying all the right things. It was just a matter of putting everything together because we still have to, I mean, one of the things they were trying to solve, I would assume is, you know, how can we build buildings faster? Uh, we hear about this whole lack of supply that we're going to run into and lack of labor and all those problems still exist. So Katera, no Katera, the issue is still here. So the industry is going to have to find a solution so I think you're right. I don't see us getting set back too much because we're already kind of trying to play catch up. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you know, it's it, this whole thing was it's interesting. Um, I don't know when our Paul Wintour episode is going to come out, but we made after mentions. this one. Okay, yeah. So we had made we had mentioned Katera in that one, and. Uh, you know, sure enough, the next day after we recorded that one, Katera closes its doors. Now, this what I'm curious... so ironic when you think about like some of our past episodes, it all kind of led to talking about a Katera type company. Exactly. I'm, I'd be interested to see if uh, they'll be moving forward with their projects that they have in um, Saudi Arabia and India, um, you know. This is still very fresh news, but uh, they did get that two hundred million dollar investment, um, you know, back early in this year um, from the Vision One Fund. Um, so we'll see. So, how do you think we move forward? Um, you know, what what do you think is the biggest lesson we take away from this? And you know, who do you think, what type of company is going to step up and try to take this on mm. in a hypothetical world? In a hypothetical world, I think it'll have to be a design build firm um, that does it. Like you said earlier, um, it's going to need to be somebody who has um, architects, engineers, and experienced um, construction professionals already in house. It's going to need to be a company that already self performs its own, you know, concrete, drywall, interiors, whatever. They need to, you know, have experience self performing and managing labor. Um, and it's going to be a company that <laughs> is not going to try to grow too fast you know, and just try to throw hundreds of millions of dollars at something. Um, it's, and it's also going to need to be a company that already has, you know, um, giant warehouses as well to try to get kind of an assembly line prefabrication type thing going. So um, whoever that company is, you know, maybe they'll have a uh, VC come along and try to run it back. I don't know. You know, I, um, when I was doing some of this research and I was listening into this uh, webinar the other day, we all recognize that there's this problem in the industry and we keep saying like, there's going to be a firm that comes in and disrupts it like a Katera and something that they kept talking about, which is interesting is that it, you know, it may not be a, it may not be a firm that does it, but the fact that as an industry, we actually have to be able to work together and do it as a whole. And so it isn't just 
one person, you know, one group tries to like use brute force to change everything, but it is actually um, the, the overall industry coming together and collaborating with, you know, somebody on the call was like, we need to collaborate with our competitors. We need to be able to openly talk about our failures. We need to be able to learn from each other to actually push it forward. We like to hold everything in, in the industry because we look at that as our competitive advantage. But in fact, you know, it could easily be what becomes our downfall. Um, so, you know, what is your thoughts about it's not just one company that just changes everything, but in fact, maybe it is all companies finally kind of realizing what challenges we have ahead and starting to, you know, collaborate and communicate better and partner and do all those type of things. It's tough. Because um. <laughs> money talks, right? So like yeah. people, you know, I mean, that's the benefit of kind of hoarding knowledge is the fact that it is a, a competitive advantage. You know? It's tough because, you know, like you said, money talks, but we're also, we're all on our own team. And, you know, I know when I worked as a mechanical contractor, I wasn't, and we went out to vendor events. We weren't super chummy with the other guys. We weren't talking about what worked really well for us, what didn't work really well for us. But what I have seen are peer groups that get together, um, you know, from multiple different areas of the country to discuss, you know, shared pains, gains, whatever, whatever kind of fun stuff you want to say. So I think, you know, that's something we already have. And the fact that the companies are from all over the country, they're not necessarily competitive. Um, they're really more regional. Um, but, you know, trying to build a turnkey company like Katera will certainly require some acquisition. Well, I wonder, you know, is the solution to our problem of lack of supply and labor shortage a turnkey company? You know, maybe that wasn't the right concept was to have everything under one roof. Maybe it is, you know, this a conglomerate of multiple firms that are able to feed themselves when necessary, but can come together and have, you know, the, the backing of a large firm. You know, maybe we see some of that where it's, uh, they're still individual entities. They have their own, you know, vision and, and whatever, but, they, um, we support each other because it, I think it's going to take more like-minded companies because even if Katera was as successful, uh, there'd be one and, you know, they're not going to solve the problem that we run into alone. So ups, there'd have to be another, another one at that point. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's going to be interesting going forward. I mean, there's a reason why they're called specialty contractors because they specialize in whatever it is they're doing. Um, you know, general contractors are very knowledgeable about the entire building, but they don't know necessarily know what goes into procuring, you know, all this, you know, copper pipe or um, cement or things like that. Um, they just know how to manage a job keep it on schedule and, uh, you know, make sure everybody is safe out there. Um, it's, <laughs> it, it's one of those things I think maybe it would have ha already happened, you know, cause we've been doing construction for hundreds, thousands of years, but it's maybe we're just so ingrained in the way that we're doing things that, it's hard to look past and think of something like that. Well, there is a ton of moving parts. I mean, there's every, every, everything. I mean, like you said, we, we deal with the weather. We, you know, you mentioned the idea of the, uh, the delivery guy, but even if that's all under your roof, you can't necessarily control if he gets there and the entrance is blocked. You know, there, there's always something that's delaying construction. Um, you know, the idea of the specialty contractor is interesting because when you looked at their website, I mean, Katera, I think specialized in every single type of pr project, 
you know, healthcare, like everything. And so you wonder, is that feasible? Because there are unique aspects that occur within each one of those. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, we keep saying we have this, these issues and maybe we have to just write them all down and say, okay, what, what exactly is it we're trying to solve? Cause I'd say we probably don't know. I mean, Katera was ultimately from what you gathered, they were hoping to um, not rely on labor as much and automate. Well, okay, that's cool. But like, what are we actually trying to do? Are we trying to produce a ton of buildings really fast? You know, do we need a ton of buildings or do we more need housing? You know, what is it? I don't know if we've even really identified what it is we need because everyone is so busy trying to stay afloat that no one wants to take the time to think about that. They're just on to the next project. You know, you're only good as your next project. That's all they're focusing on. So who should be responsible for looking at the industry as a whole? You know, because each person's, they got their own motivations. You know, there is no one governing body that's kind of paying attention. Yeah, I don't know if we'll ever get there. <laughs> but um, with prefabrication and construction in general, I said it earlier in the pod, and I apologize for interrupting you, Christopher. That was very rude of me. Bad, bad pa- yeah. podcast etiquette. But... <laughs> No, it makes no. it more like just it makes it more fun. There's not just one guy lecturing the other guy. For 10 <laughs> yeah, minutes. you're talking, you're talking, and I'm like, ah, 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 ah. Um, no two buildings are the same. Um, I was in Los Angeles this past week and I saw the ex- <laughs> I, I love how I said no two buildings are the same, and I'm about to say that two, these two buildings look the exact same <laughs> in Los Angeles and in College Station. And it was multifamily uh, housing. Even though those buildings look the exact same, what's underneath them in terms of foundation and things like that, it's completely different. You know, building uh, in Los Angeles where it's, you know, deserty is going to be a lot different than building, say, in College Station where there's clay. Um, Or Alaska where there's the tundra. Yeah. Or, oh yeah, exactly. Anywhere that it's cold, um, anywhere where it's super rocky uh, or the terrain is, um, you know, mountainy or hilly, um, no matter what, even if you're building, you know, restaurants throughout the country, no two projects are ever going to be the same. And, you know, you can prefabricate and automate you know, as much as you can, but at the end of the day, the human element will reign supreme in construction. And that's all I have to say about that. Christopher, thank you very much. (laughs) (laughs) End, end of the podcast. You know, maybe it start, maybe it starts the other way. Maybe it starts, you know, we just talked to Manish. Maybe it starts in, in school um, and trying to really instill in different ways of thinking so as they, those individuals go into the workforce, they start to bring those ideas with them. Now, keeping in mind that is as important that we're working with those older professionals who have all that expertise, but, you know, we understanding that that mentorship's a two-way street. So maybe we start at the bottom and start to educate and do more research and test aspects of the industry and, and let that percolate up through these, through these companies. Yeah. It's how we do business in the construction industry is incredibly complex and it's going to be really difficult for an outsider to come in and fully grasp it. You know, I know we've been talking a lot about this throughout the season saying that, you know, whoever's going to disrupt the industry will likely come from outside the industry. Um, and I think there, that's a valid point. Um, but you definitely need to have a full understanding of what's going on right now um, before you can truly disrupt the industry. I think that's a great way to end it. Um, the, 
it does seem like anyone that's going to try to attempt this and, and really blend this concept of, you know, this fully automated workflow turnkey, whatever needs to understand, not just the, the shop side, they need to understand the field. They need to understand the design and everything in between. Perhaps the, the person that disrupts is, is not from the outside, but actually from within, uh, but understanding the industry and what we do, I think is probably the biggest takeaway. Somebody from within, but somebody who has an open mind. Open mind from within. Yeah, you should have said that. I don't know why you didn't. It was an interesting talk. Obviously, the news is probably not the you know most cheerful news, but there are lessons learned that come out of this. I think we hope that the industry will continue to push forward. You know what they were doing there was uh, was really good. We just you know maybe we maybe we need to rethink aspects of it or or start small, not try to do everything at once. But you know I think that's it. You already said you were done talking, so I think we'll we'll end it there. Um, Hope everyone enjoys this episode and uh, we'll catch you later.